Well, first of all, the, the, the wish list, if we had one, and, and the desire for somebody of Rich's calibre was completely met. You can't replace KK, that, that's not what this is about, but it's, it's putting a great guitar player in that part of the stage to do the work that needs to be done. And Richie just exuded that much confidence right from the first moment that we met each other. We knew that, you know, he was going to embrace this, he was going to run to it, and we knew he was going to get out there and be himself and lay it down and put on a show and just give his give his all, give it a thousand percent, which is what we've done in Priest night after night for almost four decades. But to actually witness it, it's one thing to go in rehearsals and then but to actually be in front of people and watch them interact with Richie and watch Richie give back. It was just a tremendously exciting thing to experience. I mean, obviously when you're performing, you've got your own sphere of work that you've got to focus on. Glenn on guitar, you're on bass, scratch and drums, me singing. You're doing your work and you're connecting with everything else, but at the corner of your eye you can see this guy going nuts and, <laughs> you know, throwing the shapes and crowds just reaching out and really accepting what Richie was giving. For me, it was like a mixture of relief and also exhilaration that we were we were able to, to continue as a band. Well, I grew up with bands like Priest, you know, and you perfect your moves, if you like, in front of the mirror, you know, I mean, all that sort of stuff, you know, your poses and all that stuff. You know, when you're a kid growing up, you've got the guitar and whatever, even when you don't, you've got the air guitar on you. So you sort of grow up and it goes in full circle, so you sort of know what to do, you know how to carry yourself and it obviously it doesn't happen overnight you do a lot of groundwork a lot of gigging in pubs and clubs and honing your craft outside of the instrument you know it was kind of natural to sort of fit into that environment I played big stages before obviously lower down the bill it was kind of a natural thing which you've been working towards in front of the mirror for decades so it, it came pretty natural really it became better because of Trent's involvement in Dry Vogelvey from Skinny Puppy, who was, you know, in, in the mixing and the engineering. Somebody put me in touch with Bob Marlette, who introduced me to John Lowry, Johnny Five, and we just started to jam, and we had these very heavy songs, very simple three-piece, four-piece ideas. I go to Mardi Gras, I see a friend of mine, we're taking a drive, and he goes past Trent studio and that Trent Reznor lives there. I go, oh, really? You should go and knock on the door and say hello. I don't do that kind of thing because I've always been a big Nine Inch Nails fan. So we're driving around and then we drive around again and then it's one of these fake things. I said, stop the car. He goes, you, you're going to go away? I said, just stop the car. Stop the car. Get out of the car, walk across the street, and knock on the Sharon Tate door. Tap, tap, tap. And this disembodied voice is like, Rob Alford, what are you doing here? And I'm like, What's going on? He goes, this is Ray Vogelby from Skinny Puppy. I'll come right down. I'm in the building, you know, and we're chatting, and Trent's going to be here in a minute, you know, he'd, he'd love to meet you, and that's how it was. We met. I'd got a cassette with me. He said, what are you doing now? And I'm like, well, I'm just hanging out. I mean, in, in retrospect, it sounds like, oh, this is a setup, but it genuinely wasn't. It was one of those instinct things. And I said, I've got a few tunes. I'll let them come in, can I have a listen? So yeah, so we went to the studio and he puts the cassette in and within 10 minutes he goes, can I get on board with this? I'm like, what do you mean? I'd like to see what I can do if that's cool with you. Let's go. We did some work together in New Orleans and I went up to Vancouver where Ray Bowlby was at and we were in Brian Adams' studio and put the record together. And then it was released on um, Trent's label. Resurrection album was, was very important for me and I think it did kind of heal some wounds that I didn't deliberately inflict. I wasn't throwing anything against the wall just to see if it would stick. I was genuinely enjoying myself. You know, that was the, that was the whole object, if there, if there was such a thing, of, of going out and, and meeting other players and making this music. I believed in what we did and had fun with it, but I think I was able to kind of really and truly understand how important Priest was in my life by being away from the band. Came up with this idea, I was, because I'm, I'm a fan of classical music, you know, the three tenors, it just occurred to me, I was watching the DVD one day, and it, it occurred to me, wouldn't this be great if we could get three singers? And we'll call it the three tremors, which I, <laughs> which I instantly trademarked. That's still all waiting to get off the ground, and it must have created something in people's minds, because even now people are discussing it, so it's one of those things that needs to be fulfilled. I don't know how it's going to happen or when it's going to happen, but 
It would be very interesting to see what the outcome would be.